Hill New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We are so excited that you chose to join us for Bible study on tonight. I received a morning devotional message from Dolores Sattler of the Holy Trinity Baptist Church that read, Choices. We make choices about what to wear, what to eat, where to go, a partner or a friend, and much more. Joshua made a choice for his entire house about who to serve. Without a doubt, his choice was the best choice for us as we travel along our journey. journey. Our scripture tonight will come from, Jer from uh, Joshua 24 and 15. And it reads, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So this year, as this year comes to a close, if you haven't made up your minds on as to who you're going to serve, make your choice today to serve the Lord, the self-existing God whose name is Jehovah. He is the one who sits high and looks low, and he controls everything and everybody in this world. So accept Jesus today. And there is a quote that says, don't leave earth without Jesus. So make Jesus your choice. Decided 
you made Jesus. Eternal God in heaven, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we come. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, we thank you, Father, again for just being good and being God. Lord, we thank you for another privilege to come before you in prayer and studying the word. Lord, we ask you to bless your word to, tonight, Father. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will keep rolling on just a little while longer. That life, Father God, as we know it, will be for the better. We ask you to bless us now as we study that your word will be real, revealed unto us and be real to us. Bless us this night, Father God, as we move forward in your word, that your word, Father God, will be the primary reasons by which we live to hear from you, to glorify you, and to bless your holy name. It's in the precious, powerful name of Jesus the Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. To make Jesus Amen. Bless the name of Jesus. We thank God for another privilege, another opportunity just to be here to study the word of God, to study God's word, to study God's holy and righteous word. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are back in Psalm number 103. Psalm number 103 is where we are on tonight and we're looking forward to god speaking to us on tonight that is psalm 103 is where we are tonight thank god for the privilege to to listen to his word and to observe what his word has to say on tonight psalm number 103 we will look to finish these last few verses here we'll begin tonight at verse number 13 Verse number 13 is where we are tonight. The psalmist in Psalm 103, David is looking at this psalm. He is singing a song. Uh, when we look at songs, he is singing a song. So the book of song, as we have stated, is listed as numbers and not chapters. So David begins this song by talking about, bless the Lord, O my soul. And everything that is within me, bless his holy name. And as he look uh, to God, he compares what we know here on earth to what God is doing in heaven. David says, bless the Lord, all that is within me. And then whatever you do, don't forget his many benefits. He lists some of his benefits. These are just a few of the benefits that David lists. He talks about the fact that he, he redeems my life from destruction. He gives me mercy. He gives me grace. He forgives my sins and he forgives my iniquities. He heals me from all of my diseases. He redeems my life. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. God is really doing it on our behalf. He blesses us. And he blesses us in spite of us, in spite of our meanness, in spite of our cruelties. God is yet blessing us. He goes on to say, the psalmist says he blesses us with tender mercies. He blesses us and crowns us with loving kindness. The psalmist says that he encourages us. And every now and then we need some encouragement. Every now and then he says he encourages us with good things. He says in, in verse number, number six, he says he executes righteousness. This execution of righteous means that he gives us security. He secures us. He executes righteousness and judgment to all who are oppressed. Those people who are oppressed, those of us who are oppressed, God is not asleep. God is watching and God will be the one who takes vengeance. God says that vengeance is mine said the Lord. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. God will, will take care of it. God will fix it. God will redeem us. And God will also deal with the justice on our behalf. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Verse number seven, he says that he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel simply means that the leader ought to know God's ways. The leader needs to know how God handles things. The leader has to spend time, quality time with God. And as you know, 
Moses was one who spent quality time with God. So the leader has to spend quality time with God and the people have to spend quality time with God. And when you spend quality time with God, then you get to know who he is. God gets to feel you and you get to feel God. And then he deals with the fact that the children of Israel recognized and knew the acts of God. You know, many times if we're not the leader, we just looking for the blessing. God, give me the mighty acts. God, show me the mighty acts. Give me what I've been praying about. And Lord, whatever you do, give it to me right now. So the leader has to make sure not only does he observe the acts of God, but he also have to make sure that he knows God ways, know how God is, know what God expects. So we have to spend quality time with God. Verse number eight says, the Lord is merciful and he's gracious. The Lord is just so kind to us. The Lord is full of mercy. He's so kind to us, he's so gracious. The Lord always blesses us. He blesses us regardless of who we are. He blesses us regardless of what we've done. And tonight when we get down to verse number 13, he's gonna compare his blessings of his children to the blessings of a good father. The Lord is merciful and gracious. The Lord is slow to anger and he's abounding in mercy. The psalmists keep reminding us of how merciful God is. In other words, God is so merciful until he keep giving us stuff, good stuff when we deserve bad stuff. He keeps blessing us when we deserve to be cursed. He keeps blessing us when we deserve to be disciplined. God keeps right on blessing us. He's so merciful. He is slow to anger. He's abounding. Abounding means he's, he has plenty of mercies. He, he gives us mercy over and over again. If you were to testify tonight, you have to say that God gave you mercy over and over again. Not just a second chance, but chance after chance after chance. He is the merciful God. There's no God like our God. He is a merciful. He is the merciful God. Verse 9 says, he will not strive with us always. He won't put up, our stu put up with our stuff. Even though he's merciful, he won't put up with our stuff always. Even in his mercy, he's a disciplinarian. He's a disciplined God. He is a God that will get our attention. And sometimes God needs to get our attention like a good parent ought to get their children attention. God is such a merciful God. But in the process of being merciful, God will not always strive. King James says here, he will not always chide with us always. He will not always put up with our stuff. In the midst of his mercy, we ought not take advantage of his mercy nor will he keep his anger forever. Talks about, first of all, that God is slow to anger. And then God will not keep his anger forever. Some people will get upset with you and be upset with you until Jesus get back. But what we have to understand is once it is said and done, once you have told your side, once things have, have done, has been done properly, then you have to understand that you got to leave it alone. You have to leave it alone. Don't, don't keep bringing it up and don't keep holding a person hostage with it. Make sure you get to a point in your life where you are willing to forget the wrong that was done to you. Make sure you're willing to let a person make it. Make sure you're willing to move forward and not just keep going over and over in the midst of everything that's been going on. Be willing to move forward. You must be willing to forgive and move on. You have to be willing to do it. 
you have to be willing. The, the Bible says that God will not keep his anger forever. God will not keep his anger forever. See, God is not like man. God is not like man. Man will get mad at you and stay mad at you. But God, the God we serve, he will move forward and he will constantly forgive us. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Verse number 10, God has not dealt with us according to our sins. Now our sins depict that we ought to be gone. <laughs> Our sins suggest, and our sins are of such that we ought to be dead. Our sins are of such that we should have been punished a long time ago, and we should be punished forever. But God is so merciful. He has not dealt with us according to our sin. The problem is, many times, we deserve death. Many times, we deserve sickness. Many times we deserve to be left out in the cold, but the God we serve just keep bringing us in. The God we serve just keep giving us another chance. He is the merciful God. He does not deal with us like we ought to be dealt with, nor does he punish us according to our iniquities. He does not punish us according to our iniquities. We talked about the difference between sin and, this, and iniquities. Sin is what we do every day and we keep doing sin and we make sure that we sin because we like to sin. Sometimes we sin and we don't even want to sin. Sin is that which God says is wrong, period. Iniquity is also that which God says is wrong. However, Iniquity is when you create a lifestyle of sin. That means you've gotten so far and so deep in, you don't know how to get out. But the only way to get out is to stop where you are, stop it, and move forward. Stop it. Just quit it. Just quit it. Quit it right now. Stop it. And when you stop it, then you can, you can move forward. So you have to get out of sin, get out of iniquities. Last week, we compared as the as as the psalmist compares, for the heaven as is as high as for the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Those who respect God, God keeps giving them mercy. Those who disrespect God, God can't even give them mercy. There's a respect that has to take place regardless of what's going on. When when my daughter was little and and, and we would talking about what she could and could not do. I said to her, bad things you will do, but disrespectful things is another level. You can, you can do some wrong things and some things you would do wrong and you are intended to do them wrong. We will address that with a conversation. But when it comes to disrespect, you cannot disrespect and expect just a conversation. Oh, this was long before time out. <laughs> and whenever disrespect was on the scene, it was always more than just a conversation. It was two, three, four, five licks or so, regardless of, of what was the disrespectful act and regardless of who she disrespected. Well, Daddy, who can I not disrespect okay you cannot disrespect police officers firefighters you can't disrespect principals teachers you can't disrespect senior saints you can't disrespect your elders you cannot disrespect mama daddy you cannot disrespect auntie cousin so daddy that's everybody that's the idea that's exactly what the idea is mm -hmm. disrespect cannot be toler tolerated and so we cannot disrespect god so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Those who respect God, God will give you an abundance of mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. He's removed our transgression. This word transgression simply means our trespasses. 
when we read King James and we do do our prayer, the the um, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's it's really the model prayer. When we do the model prayer, as found in Matthew chapter six, when we do that model prayer, we understand real well that Jesus is telling us this is the way we ought to pray. And when He tells us this is the way we ought to pray, we begin by saying, "Our Father who art in heaven," and we end by saying, "Forgive us our trespasses." It's another name for sin. Our trespasses. When you come onto another person's property and you should not be there, you are trespassing. When we get engaged with the devil, we are trespassing. When we move from our location to somebody else's location and we're not welcome there, we are trespassing. What I'm saying to you, Many of us grew up in Sunday school, grew up uh, doing God's will. We grew up fearing the Lord, but then we began to trespass onto the devil's property. The reason why children can't make it in this life of sin is because they didn't grow up in sin. And if you didn't grow up in sin, many times sin will eat you alive. This world will eat you alive. There are some people who grew up with sin. Sin was just another day to them. But there are some children that didn't grow up doing these things. And when they try to do these things, they find themselves trespassing and they find themselves miserable. The Sunday school girl, the Sunday school boy, the holy roly, the holy then thou, all of them find themselves trying to be like the world and the world eats them alive. It's because they are trespassing. This is not your lifestyle. This is not the style that you grew up under. You grew up in a godly household. And now since you've gotten with other people, you determined to do it the wrong way. That means you're sinning. And that means you are trespassing. Trespassing. You have gone upon somebody else's property that means that there is transgressions forgive us for our transgression he removes us from our transgression he removes us from our trespasses mm -hmm. he removes it verse 13 begins the final part of this pericope verse 13 says as the father pities his children as the father pities his children so the lord pities those who fear him for he knows our frame he knows our makeup god has mercy on us he has compassion on us because he knows he remembers that we are dust god knows how he's made us god knows how he fashioned us God understand that we are nothing but dust and dust needs a savior. Dust needs a savior. Dust, he remembers we are dust and dust cannot take care of itself. Dust cannot think right on his own. Dust cannot do the right things. God remembers that we are dust. And because he remembers that we are dust, it's up to God to take care of us because we don't have sense enough to take care of ourselves. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. In his place, remember it no more. He compares us three ways here. He First of all, he says that men, well, several ways. First of all, he compares us to being dust in which we are dust. Then he compares us to grass. For man, for as for man, his days are like grass. I mean, grass is something that's there today and gone tomorrow. Is there today and is gone tomorrow. And then he compares us to flowers of the field. We come up and flourish. We grow, we look good, we look beautiful, we do the great things that God is pleased with. And then guess what? We fade away. 
Verse 16, for the wind passes over it and it is gone. The wind, we don't even know where the wind comes from. We don't know where the wind leaves and goes to. We don't know where the wind is. We just can feel it and sometimes we can hear it. Jesus gives this analogy to, to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He gives this analogy. And when he gives this analogy to, Nic to Nicodemus, he says in this analogy, he says, you see the wind, you hear the wind, you don't see it, you don't know where it comes from. Do you understand the wind? He says, you must be born again. And because you don't understand the wind, you won't understand the things of God. John chapter 3, verse 3, he says, if you are not born again, you cannot understand the things of God. He says it by action in, in King James. He says that you cannot see the kingdom. You cannot understand the kingdom. You cannot realize what the kingdom is all about unless you are born again. Therefore, we have to stop expecting people who are not saved to see saved things, to understand saved things, to be with saved things, and to be beside saved things. We have to make sure that we understand that a person must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to understand what Jesus has in store. We must be born again we must be saved so he says for the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place remember it no more once the wind is gone whatever place the wind passed by is gone and that place forgot the wind even showed up <laughs> let me tell you one of these days somebody's gonna forget forget you ever showed up one of these days somebody is gonna forget not everybody, because I'm sure you're leaving a great legacy. Every person ought to leave a legacy. Every person ought to leave something that people will remember them by, something good that people will rem remember you by. But there will be a small group of people that pass by you right now, and they won't even know you showed up. I like to say, and I like to think that once I'm gone, people will remember I came by. But the truth of the matter is, some folk won't even know I showed up. Therefore, we ought not seek fame and fortune. We ought to seek God. The Bible says he fears God. Those who fear God, God gives them mercy. Verse 16 says that place remembers it no more. Verse 17, <clears throat> but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to the children's children. The, the mercy of the Lord, the mercy of this self-existing God, the mercy of the God Jehovah, the mercy of the God who is the, the national title for the, for the Israelites, this God, the self-existing one that existed without any creation, this God, the self-existing God, he acknowledges us. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. He is so merciful to us until he gives us mercy from the time we got here. Matter of fact, from the time we, we, we arrived on the scene, before that time, God was merciful to us. God was so merciful to us until he, he saw to it that we got down through the birth canal. He was merciful to us. That's why every year when daddy was living, every year I would call mom and daddy on April 15th and thank them for allowing me to be born April 15th, 1963. For many years, I've been calling them just to say, mama, Daddy, I appreciate you. It's my birthday, so that means that you allowed me to be born. And I thank God for allowing me to be born and thank you for not aborting me because several children my age were being aborted. But I thank them because I don't take it for granted that I'm here. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. God gave me so much mercy until I'm here. 
And not only did he give me mercy to get here, he gave me mercy to be here. And he has given me mercy to be born again. I thank God he's given me mercy to be saved. There are some people that will not be saved. Salvation is a choice. But God has given me mercy to be born again. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, God's mercy exists whether we acknowledge it or not. God's mercy exists whether or not uh, we accept it or not. God's mercy is available to us even if we do not accept it. He says his mercy. The psalmist says his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting for those who fear him, those who, who reverence him, those who respect him. It is from everlasting, everlasting to everlasting. In his righteousness are to the children's children. So we can get blessed by fearing the Lord all the way down to three generations. And we know that God's blessings are beyond those three generations. But God is able to bless us down through three generations. You remember David saying, I used to be young, but now I'm old. And out of all my life, I haven't seen the righteous forsaken, nor the seed of the righteous begging for bread. I want, to re- I want to recall it to God's attention that God promised that the righteous will not be forsaken and the seed of the righteous will not be begging for bread. Mm-hmm. The seed, the, the, the children of children. God has a way of blessing us. If we fear him, let me tell you, we have the opportunity to be blessings to grandchildren. We have the opportunity to be a blessing to other people's children. We have to fear the Lord, respect him, and we have to walk with him. We have to fear the Lord. To such as keep his commandment and to those who remember those commandments to do them. God is merciful to those who respect him and fear him. God is merciful to those who live in righteousness with him. God is merciful to those who keep his covenant and his commandments. We are in covenant with God. We are in covenant with God. A covenant means that God, you do this part, I'm going to do my part. But how often do we not do our part while God is doing his part? We're in covenant with God. We ought to do our part. We even made promises to God. We ought to do our part. Let's do our part and respect God. Let's do our part and keep our covenant, keep God's commandments. Let's do our part and make sure that we remember his commandments and do them. God is merciful to us. Verse number, verse number 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. God has a throne as in heaven. God is in heaven and earth is his footstool. God has a throne in heaven. His mercy has blessed us on earth. Let me just share with you. The fact of the matter is his kingdom rules over all. I know it looks like the devil is winning. I know it looks like the devil is ruling. But the God we serve is super ruling. The God we serve is ruling and he will rule forever and he will rule over all. Times are tough right now. Things are in a shabble right now. Things are shaken up right now. But God still rules. And God rules over all. He will always rule over all. Regardless of who's in power, God rules. Nothing happens without God's knowledge. Nothing takes place with God without God's approval. No, God doesn't want all these things to happen that's happened, but God is in control. 
doesn't make sense doesn't make sense to my my little noggin it doesn't make sense but the fact of the matter is god is in control god is the is the one that's keeping us even when we're doing bad god allows us to do good even when things are hard on us god is in control in such a way that he keeps it from being even worse god is the one in control we have to trust god god keeps us he rules over all he rules over heaven and he rules over earth he rules under the earth he rules in the sea he rules on dry land god is in control the lord has established his stone the throne in heaven the lord has a kingdom and he rules over all his kingdom rules his kingdom rules wherever there's a king there has to be a kingdom wherever there's a kingdom there has to be a king and if the kingdom rules then that means the king rules the king is in charge what we have to understand is god is in control regardless if we are not pleased with what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. It is a setup for our blessings. God has positioned us in such a way till he can bless us even in the midst of all this trouble. God, so ask God, God, you're up to something. I know you're working behind the scene. What are you up to, God? And, and if you are up to some God, I'm going to trust you. I can't worry about it. I can't stress over it. I'm going to trust you, God. And because you are trustworthy and because you are trustworthy, God, I am going to trust you even when it doesn't look well. Even when life is messed up for me, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to keep trusting you. We have to trust this God that we serve. If we're going to walk in faith, we got to walk in faith in the good times and the bad times. Verse number 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. The psalmist says to the angels, angels, you all are the one that do God's word. Angels, you're the one who carry out God's functions. Angels, you're the one who excel in strength. Angels, whatever you do, bless the Lord. Praise him. Praise the Lord. He started off by talking to himself. Then he began to talk to us. Now he's talking to the angels. He says, bless the Lord, you his angels. And he's talking to the angels that the Lord rules over and that belong to the Lord. Bless the Lord, you, his angels, these angels who excel in strength. These angels excel in strength. Even though they have strength, they have to armor themselves before the king of the kingdom. Even though their lives are depending on God, even though they have strength, they need to understand that their lives are dependent on him, and they have to understand that God is the one who gives them strength. So we are to praise the Lord, bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, bless the Lord who do his word. The word, the Lord speaks and guess what happened? The angels make it happen. The Lord's word is clear to the angels and because of the Lord's word, the angels get busy. They even heed the voice of God. It says, heeding the voice of his word. They heed God's vo voice. They heed it. They take attention to it, and they make it happen. They heed his word. Verse 21, bless the Lord, all you his host, you ministers of, him, of his, who do his pleasure. And he begins to talk to the heavenly hosts. Then he talks to the ministers that, that get things done. He says, bless the Lord. 
Bless the Lord, all you hosts. Bless the Lord. What he's saying is the angels ought to bless him, the ministers ought to bless them. And verse 22 says, bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. And he closes by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. The psalmist is clear. He begins off by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. He ends up by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. The psalmist walks through it and he talks about how merciful this God is. He talks about how he is long suffering. He talks about how this God has a way of disciplining us. He talks about this psalmist talked about this God that sits in heaven. This God who has a kingdom in heaven. This God who makes a way for us that is so com compassionate toward us. The psalmist lays it out in Psalm 103. He says, and when you get the chance, get a chance to read it, read it for yourself. He says, great is his mercy. Mercy is when we deserve to be wiped out, but God keep having compassion and pity on us. When we ought to be taken out of here. When we should have lost our minds. God kept our minds. We should have lost our physique. God kept our physique. When life should have been wiped out, God kept us on planet Earth. When we should have been under the ground, God kept us on top of the ground. He has loving kindness. He is merciful to us. And he says, the psalmist says, bless the Lord. The psalmist says, get excited about the Lord. The psalmist says, my soul, my innermost being, come on, bless the Lord. The psalmist gives a great example to us tonight that we ought to bless the Lord too. And we ought to bless the Lord from the bottom of our souls. Our innermost being ought to praise him, glorify him, magnify him, thank him. We ought to do whatever we do to praise him. We ought to praise the Lord. Final reason why we ought to praise the Lord is because he has done great things for us. And the greatest thing that he's done for us is given his son. His name is Jesus. This season is because of Jesus. As we celebrate Christmas or Christmas, not Xmas. As we celebrate Christ, we need to remember what he has done. He died on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. He gave his life for you and me. God gave his very best, and Jesus gave his very best. God gave his only son the very best he had. God gave it for you and for me. He died on Calvary. After he died, they laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it long. Early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. God gave his son, Jesus gave his life. He died a voluntary death. They laid him in a barber tomb, Joseph's brand new tomb. The good news is early that third day morning, he rose with all power, all power in heaven and earth in his hand. And that same power that got up with the dead Jesus, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, roused him from the dead. God woke Jesus up out of a dead sleep. He was all the way dead. He, he brought Jesus back to life. Jesus got up that day just for you and for me. And that same Jesus is waiting and calling. He's calling for you right now. 
if you never received Jesus as your personal savior, this is your moment. This is a great opportunity. You can get to know him. Get to know Jesus because he's waiting. The door is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. Don't wait to Sunday. Sunday is not guaranteed. Come just like you are. I had to come just like I am and just like I was. And every now and then I still kind of go back and renew a right spirit. Ask God to renew that right spirit within me. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, will you bow your head with me right now and invite him into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer honestly, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. We believe that you're born again. You're on your way to heaven when you leave earth. If you wrestle with sin like we all do, I pray that God continue to bless you. And during this season, make sure that you do what's right for God. During this season, make sure you remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. I want to ask God to bless us during this season. Father God, we thank you. We, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another chance. Now, Lord, bless every person that struggle, struggle in life, struggle in finances, struggle in their health. Bless them, Father God, that they will walk with you. Lord, we ask you to give them hope and give them strength. Give them focus. Give them power. Amaze the doctors by healing all that listens. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us to remember Jesus. His life, his birth, his death, burial, his resurrection. And we know you guarantee us the return. Now, Lord, we thank you for the New Beginning Church. We ask you to bless us that we will be a beacon light in a dark and dismal world. Show us how to please you. Show us how to honor you and bless our lives. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless every church open and maintaining Jesus' standards. It's tough for churches. Church, it's tough for church members. Lord, we ask you, Father, to bless us as we close out this year, that we will close it out with you. Anoint us for your service. Bless us, Lord, that we won't look at ourselves, but look to Jesus. Lord, we thank you now. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. It is offering time. If you would like to give an offering to the New Beginning Church, please feel, so, please feel free to do so by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, 
Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We're lifting all of you in prayer. Those on our prayer list is very extensive and very long. We're also praying for the Warner family. We're praying for the Warner family, that God will comfort them in times like these. We're lifting them before the Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us all sing together. Amen, amen, and amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, In I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.